Do you know that there is only one God in three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you know that Jesus said he is the only way to heaven, and his death and resurrection bring forgiveness of sins to all who believe? Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study God's Word, the Bible, together. Welcome to the Pastor's Study. A tour guide is taking a busload of tourists through Israel. And he says on the microphone up front, you know, in Israel, the shepherd always leads the sheep and the sheep follow. In other cultures, the shepherd from behind drives the sheep ahead of him. They come over the hill. People start giggling because here is a man driving a flock of sheep ahead of him. The tour guide says, bus driver, stop. He gets off the bus. He, you know, I've never seen this in Israel. The shepherds always lead the sheep in Israel. And the man says, well, yes, that's right. Well, so how come you're driving the sheep ahead of you? And he said, because I'm not the shepherd. I'm the butcher, and I'm driving them to slaughter. <laughs> Whether you know it or not, you, me, everybody in the world is either being led by the shepherd or we're being driven by the butcher. In this program, I want us to talk about Jesus, the Good Shepherd, and I want to talk about what Jesus will call as the thief, the butcher, Satan. Would you open your Bible to John chapter 10, and let's pray first. Father, we pray for all of us, which is everybody, that has ever been hurt by the devil and our own flesh and the world that you will guide us now, Lord, to start following the shepherd instead of being driven by the butcher. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 10, starting at verse 1. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. Let's stop there. The question I want us to ask from John 10.10 10 is, who is the thief? Well, here's the definition given in that verse. A thief is anyone who won't enter through Jesus. We're going to find out in a minute, Jesus is the door. If you don't enter through Jesus for your salvation, you're a thief. So does that mean Buddha and Muhammad and Confucius and Krishna and New Age gurus today are thieves? That's exactly what it means. Um, and in this context, though, Jesus said these words about 30 A.D. In this context, who are the thieves? Well, we kind of know because the verse right ahead of this, he's talking to the Pharisees, the Jewish religious leaders, and they were teaching that the way you're saved is kind of by earning it, being good enough, and then you'll be saved, and none of that works because we're sinners. So in this context, the Pharisees were the thieves. But let's ask another question. Who is the ultimate thief? That would be the devil. Because Jesus says in, Acts, in John chapter 8, Pharisee, you are of your father, the devil. So the Pharisees and the devil are both the thief. Let's ask one more question before we go to the next verse, though. Today, who are the thieves? I think the answer is any false religious teacher. Do we have false religious teachers in the church today? You've heard me preach on this. I used to be a pastor in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It used to be a liberal denomination. I was never comfortable. Now it's not liberal. It's radical. I led my congregation out of the ELCA and we joined a more biblical branch of Lutheranism. There's an ELCA Lutheran pastor in Arkansas who was teaching that Jesus and the disciple John had a homosexual relationship. And he's still a full pastor in the ELCA. Maybe you've heard of Pastor Nadia Bowles Weber, uh, an ELCA Lutheran pastor who writes books on the New York Times list. Well, uh, Nadia Bowles Weber is now divorced, and she has talked publicly about how electrifying sex is with her boyfriend. And she said, quote, F man, why would the church be against this? They, the ELCA leadership 
put Nadia Bowles Weber in front of 31,000 Lutheran teenagers at the teen convention, and she had them all repeat after me, I renounce the lie that queerness is anything other than beauty. Nadia Bowles Weber gave Gloria Steinem a golden vagina sculpture at a women's conference to thank Gloria for her feminist work. You know what the ELCA recently did? They made Nadia Bowles Weber their pastor of public witness. We have whole denominations now that are being the thief. You know, I got an email, Pastor Brock, you're so hateful talking about these things. I'm doing this out of love. I want people to get out of churches that are leading them over the cliff and join a biblical denomination. There are good, if you're Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, there's good alternative denominations to your liberal branch. All right, let's look at verse 2. But he who enters the door, who he who enters by the door, is a shepherd of the sheep. All right, let's ask this question. Who is the shepherd? We're talking small s. Who, who are the good religious leaders? Who's the good pastor? Here's the answer. The one who enters through Jesus. You can tell who a good pastor is because he urges you to go through Jesus. When I was a youth director many years ago now, I worked under a certain Lutheran pastor that just didn't preach about Jesus hardly at all. And years later, I have a buddy, Leon, who worked with him as a co-pastor, and I said, Leon, do you think he's a Christian? And Leon said, I've wondered that, because his sermons are so nice and fluffy, but he rarely talks about Jesus. You can spot a good shepherd because he's urging you to go through the door of Jesus. Now we're going to see who the true shepherd is, though, capital S, verse 3. Jesus said to him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And a stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. This figure Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. Jesus therefore said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, uh, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Here's the next lesson. The true ultimate shepherd, capital S, is Jesus, who is the only one who can give salvation. He says, I am the door of the sheep, period. He doesn't say, there's many doors to God, many paths to God, take your pick. He said, no, I'm it, period, pick me. Let me quote to you two very offensive verses in our modern day. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, period. And then the apostles preached the same thing in Acts chapter 4. There is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved than the name of Jesus. So let me say something very offensive. Jesus is the only way you can get into heaven. Now and then, for this TV show, I go heresy hunting. I don't do this very often because it's emotionally draining. But now and then, I'll go to a church that I know is bad and report on it for our TV show. All right, there is a large congregational church in downtown Minneapolis known for having radical theology. So I went. One of the pastors is transgender. It's a woman who looks like a man, and he, she got up and read the scriptures. I think a different pastor, or maybe a, a different pastor preached, will say, <laughs> I'm sitting there at the, in the service just dying. And the senior pastor, comes over to me, kind of leans next to, kneels down next to my pew and says, Pastor Brock, I see your TV show. I think you're probably as uncomfortable here as I am watching your show. <laughs> then after the service, there was a Bible study and they brought in a Methodist professor to do the Bible study. And the Methodist professor is making the point that there are many ways to get into heaven. And while he's preaching, my heart starts going like this. And I'm just there to take notes. I'm not there to say a word, but boom, but a boom. Finally, 
I couldn't help it. My hand goes up. I said, excuse me, Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, he's the only way to heaven. What do you do with that? Well, said the Methodist professor, what Jesus meant was love is the only way to heaven. So whoever loves is going to heaven. Mm, but that's not what he said. <laughs> Listen, um, I, I had a couple in my church and the lady says, Tom, have we ever told you why we started coming to your church? I said, no. Well, our other Lutheran pastor got in the pulpit one Sunday and preached on John 14, 6, where Jesus said he's the only way. And the pastor from the pulpit said, I don't know why Jesus said that. We know our God is bigger than that. And she said, I turned to my husband and said, let's get out of here. He's correcting Jesus from the pulpit. <laughs> Listen, I know people will be offended, but Christian, it's your job, it's my job to humbly, lovingly tell people there's only one Savior. There's not 15, there's one. Now, for the last part of the sermon, let's take a closer look at what the thief's job, the devil's job is, and then we'll look at what the shepherd, Jesus' job is. Look at verse 10. Jesus said, the thief, the devil, false teachers, the Pharisees, the thief comes only to steal. Now, let's stop there. Steal what? What does the devil want to steal from you? Well, see if you can catch this. Um, do you remember when Jesus told the parable of the sower and the man's throwing all the seeds all over the place and the birds come and gobble up the seed? And he said, the seed is the word of God and the birds are the devil. So what does the devil want to uh, 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 steal from your life? The word. If Satan can keep you away from this book, he's got you. There's a saying, the Bible that is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. There's another saying, either the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. Let me repeat that. Either your sin will keep you from reading the Bible or reading the Bible will keep you from your sin. I saw a bumper sticker. Have you tormented the devil today? You know how you torment the devil? You read your Bible. The devil's job is to steal the scriptures from you. I, I learned a couple days ago one of my favorite preachers died. His name was Elmer Murdoch. I think he was in his 90s. But when I would go home to Omaha, I would sometimes slip in his church and hear Elmer Murdoch preach. Powerful preacher. So I slip into the church. This was years ago. I'm in the back row. Sitting in front of me is a mom, a dad, and a teenage daughter. Elmer Murdoch is preaching a powerful message. Mom is on the edge of her seat, listening to every word. Dad, through the sermon, is like this. The teenage daughter, through the sermon, is going. <laughs> Three people heard that sermon. No, no, no. One person heard the sermon. The other, Satan was stealing it out of their heart. Satan wants to steal the word of God from you. Second thing, Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal and kill. All right, kill what? What does the devil want to kill in your life? See if you can get to this. This is from Ephesians chapter 5. Take up the shield of faith by which you can quench the flaming darts of the evil one. And it says in 1 Peter 5, Satan roars, roams around the earth, roaring like a lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him firm in your faith. What does Satan want to kill in your life? Your faith. He knows if he can kill your faith, he's got you for eternity. I mean, I was talking with this dear 95-year-old Christian woman, her son, who is like 75, is dying and she is just heartbroken. I raised him to be a Christian. He got confirmed in the Lutheran Church. Then he turned his back on God. And if he doesn't turn to Christ before he dies, the devil's got him. Satan wants to kill your faith. So Satan's job is to steal the word of God, kill your faith. The next part of verse John 10:10, 10, 10, and to destroy. Satan's job is to destroy. All right, destroy what? See if you can catch this. Uh, Luke chapter 13, Jesus heals a woman uh, 
who's all bent over. And Jesus said, Satan bound her for 18 years. And it says in Acts chapter 10, Jesus went around healing those oppressed by the devil. So what does Satan want to destroy? Your health, your emotional health, your physical health, your marital health. Satan wants to destroy your health. I'll tell you what happened a couple of days ago. I believe in paying my taxes. The Bible says pay tax to whom taxes do. So I don't cheat on my, on my income tax. I discovered... I think maybe for 30 years I've been cheating the government because I misdid something about pastor's housing allowance. I maybe owe the government thousands of dollars. And I all day long trying to figure out, well, did I really cheat? By the end of the day, and this hasn't happened to me for years, my heart was beating, mis uh, something, I got heart palpitations. And I, I just had to pr get on my knees and pray. You know, Satan will use anxiety. Oh, Satan wants to destroy your health. Uh, I knew an, uh, an older pastor. He said he was uh, ministering to a young man who had AIDS. And he said, it was such a horrible, painful death. How can anybody say that's a good lifestyle? But you know, we have whole denominations now that have practicing homosexual pastors. United Church of Christ, the Episcopal Church, uh, ELCA Lutherans, PCUSA Presbyterians, United Methodists are about to do it, and the Reformed Church in America just did it. They're ordaining people in a lifestyle and a behavior that hurts them in this life and for eternity. Satan wants to kill your health. That's Satan's job, to kill uh, your, your uh, faith, to destroy your health, and to steal the Word of God. Let's look at the shepherd's job, verse 10. I came, said Jesus, that they might have life and might have it abundantly. The shepherd's job is to give you abundant life, not just life, but abundant life. <laughs> but Satan tries to get you to believe the opposite. You know, God's not fun. He's a killjoy. I'll give you joy, says the devil. Years ago, I was sightseeing in England. I'm on the train, sitting next to a stranger. We start to talk. He tells me, yeah, my wife and my son now go to an Assemblies of God church here in England, and my son goes to their religious school, and they're worried about Dad. But he said, I, I don't want to be a fanatic. <laughs> so I, I shared the gospel with him. I gave him a salvation pamphlet. But you know what his problem was? He thought God was out to wreck his life. And if I give my life to Christ, God will ruin it. I'll be a nut. And, and you know, I'm, I'm learning. Every time Satan tells me something, I need to believe the opposite. And you could tell, I mean, this, you could tell the, the, ma, the, the wife and the son were praying for him to put this guy next to him for, what, two hours. But ah, God is the one who gives you life. Satan is the one who will kill you. We have a wonderful Christian ministry in Minnesota called Minnesota Teen Challenge. It helps adults and teenagers get off of drugs, get off of alcohol. If they ever come to your church, don't miss that service because one by one they get up and give their testimony and how Satan beat them up and Jesus gave them life. <laughs> All right, let me close the sermon by saying this. You have a choice to make. Are you going to be following the shepherd or are you going to be driven by the butcher? I urge you to come to Christ because the devil will kill you. I, I'm going to close with this. There was a farm boy who had a very strange hobby. He would take manure, cow manure, make it into a sculpture, bake it in the sun, and then paint it and make beautiful sculpture. One day he took some manure sculpted it into an apple, baked it in the sun, and painted it red. It looked just like an apple. <laughs> but don't bite into that apple. And that's what the devil does. His job is to take stuff that's ugly and destructive and it'll kill you, and he makes it look real beautiful, and then you bite into it and it kills you. The shepherd's job is to get you away from all that so the shepherd can bring you abundant life. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we ask Pastor Brock questions regarding the Bible. Pastor Brock, our first question today comes from a viewer. My son is practicing homosexual 
is a practicing homosexual and says he believes that Jesus died on the cross and takes away our sin. Will he go to heaven? They attend a liberal church that says, of course they will. So he must attend either a United Methodist Church, Presbyterian Church USA, United Church of Christ, Episcopal Church in America, and sadly, the Reformed Church in America also just voted to uh, ordain practicing homosexuals and do gay weddings, etc. Uh, what a tragedy. And you know what I would say to this young man? I have struggled, Mona, with same-sex attraction most of my life. You go to our website, pastorstudy.org, see our TV show on it. We did a whole show. I have two articles. My struggle, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? And I would say to him, I know this is a tough road to go, but your God, Jesus Christ, is worth you giving up your boyfriend. Mm -hmm. You don't want to spend eternity in the wrong place because you know he, he says he believes in G Jesus died on the cross. The devil believes Jesus died on the cross. The verse that has kept me from going that route, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, don't be deceived. You not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, robbers, or revilers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed. So if you've committed those sins, there's forgiveness. But if you live in it, you're not going to hell. So God forgive these churches that have abandoned scripture and I would say to this young man, God love you, we'll love you, I'll help you get through this, but uh, turn around. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Another question from a viewer, how can a person best defeat the approval of homosexual, bisexual, transgender behavior in a congregation? It has been on my mind that the Presbyterian and Episcopal churches are leading people astray. And the other denominations that I just listed. But it's not all Presbyterians. The Presbyterian Church USA is leading people astray. The Presbyterian Church in America is a wonderful biblical church. Uh, it's not all Lutherans. The ELCA Lutherans are leading people astray. The Missouri Synod Lutherans, the Free Lutherans, the other Lutheran denominations are quite biblical. So if you're an ELCA Lutheran, do you know that the ELCA Lutheran and the PCUSA Presbyterian churches pay for abortions mm. for any reason with the offering dollars of their people in their church's health care plan. That's from hell. And, and so, you know, Mona, I, I was, some pastor friends and I stayed in the ELCA for years mm -hmm. trying to turn, turn that church around. But when they voted in favor of the gay, the gay stuff, when they insisted on keeping the pay for abortions with offering dollars, we tried to stop it. It was finally time, and I would say to you, if you're one of these, mm -hmm. in one of these denominations, take your money, time, and talents and go to a, a different church. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Um, another question from a viewer, how do we get young people back in the church, into the church? What can we do on a college campus that will bring young people to Christ? <laughs> well, here's what's ironic. Some of these liberal churches think, well, you know, young people are more liberal on the social issues, so we'll go pro-gay and that'll bring the young people in. The opposite has happened. Mm -hmm. The churches I just listed, they're shrinking and they're, the United Church of Christ almost doesn't exist anymore. I mean, these churches are just shrinking. So how do we get young people back into the church? Well, uh, preach scripture. Amen. And you know, maybe if you preach scripture, initially you'll lose members, mm -hmm. but hang in there long term because it's the word of God that, that attracts people. So that's what I would say. And I still believe people want to hear the word they of do. God. They do. And regarding college, I mean, Mona, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship is what kept me a Christian in college. I was uh, at Grinnell College and my faith was under attack. We had a little fellowship group that met five times a week in my dorm room. Mm -hmm. And I say to people off, going off to college, make sure you get a good Bible study you're part of because probably at college, your faith will be attacked. You need that Christian fellowship. Absolutely. It's very important. Yeah. Who are the false shepherds today in America? Well, the false shepherds or pastors or teachers are the, there's two mm -hmm. groups. The left, the people on the left, those groups I just mentioned. But on the right, on the more conservative end, are the prosperity preachers. And sadly, they're all over TV. Mm -hmm. That, you know, if you sow a seed into our ministry, you're going to reap your miracle. So you send me $500, the Lord is telling you plant a seed gift, you're going to get off your drugs. You're going to get uh, free from your cancer. You're going to get a better house. You're going to get that. This is from hell. And, and these are what's called the prosperity preachers. Mm -hmm. So on the right, avoid them. On the left, avoid the liberal mainline denominations. Go right down the middle and just preach the truth of Scripture. And know the Word of God. Amen. Um, if Jesus came to bring abundant life, how do you explain people who have been beheaded for Christ? Mm -hmm. 
We just preached on John 10, 10, where Jesus said, I came that you might have life abundantly. Mm -hmm. Well, but there are Christians in some Muslim lands that have been beheaded because they converted to Christ. Mm -hmm. Where's the abundant Christian life there? And the answer is right over the hill. When they die, they go over the River Jordan and for all eternity, they enjoy the abundant life in heaven. You know, the abundant life Jesus promises in John 10, it starts in this life. Mm -hmm. Right now we have, we have forgiveness of sins, we have meaning, we have purpose, but we ain't seen nothing yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we aren't promised a wonderful, perfect life. We all have storms. Yeah, the Bible promises uh, acts it is through many trials and tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So abundant life doesn't mean that you won't suffer. In fact, the more abundantly you're, you're growing in Christ, probably the more you're gonna suffer. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> um, if Satan wants to steal my health, does that mean that disease comes from the devil? Well, again, in Acts chapter 10, it says Jesus healed those oppressed by the devil. Mm -hmm. And the woman who was bent over for 18 years, Jesus said Satan bound her and then Jesus healed her. Satan can produce disease, so can God. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Exodus 4, God says to Moses at the burning bush, Who makes man deaf, dumb, seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? And the way to put it all together in the book of Job, Satan is hitting Job with all these diseases, mm -hmm. but God... Said, ha, Satan had to go before the throne of God to get permission before he can touch Job. Read Job 1, uh, 1, 1 2, and 3. So there you go. Yeah. Hmm. Um, isn't it narrow-minded to say Jesus is the only way of salvation? Uh, we don't do that arrogantly. We do it humbly, but we have to do it because Jesus himself said that. And, and before the camera roll, you were asking about my heart palpitations. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I, t I, I talked to a friend of mine that I grew up with in Omaha, and he said, We'll call Irv. Oh, I said, that's a great idea. Irv is a friend of mine I've known since we were 12. He's a tax expert. Mm -hmm. So after I had this whole day of having, having just anxiety, I got on my knees, I prayed, I called Irv and God, Irv's gonna take care of, I mean, I'm paying for him, but Irv's gonna take care of this for me. So if, if you're watching this show and you're upset about something, Jesus has come to give you abundant life. If you're upset, get on your knees, talk to the Lord about it, talk to other Christians about it, put it up in God's hands, because Satan wants to wreck your emotional life. Jesus wants you to have life abundant. So there you go. I want to encourage you, uh, you can go to our website, pastorstudy.org. All these TV shows you can watch for free at any time. We're on the air because of generous giving. Uh, when we get more money, we just send uh, more pe more. Uh, money to buy more airtime. So if the Lord nudges you to give, there's the website or there'll, there'll be an address in a minute. But mainly we thank you for praying for our ministry because things are taking off and we're busier than we used to be. God bless you. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because of the generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.